Hi everyone, uh, I hope you can all hear me well. We are live once again and today we have yet another amazing guest. Uh, this time it's Jay Holben. With over 30 years in the filmmaking and the cinematography world, it's really difficult to describe everything he has done for the world of filmmaking. Uh, but lens nerds like myself obviously associate Jay with his incredible book, The Senior Lens Manual, that he co-authored with uh, Christopher Probst, ASC. But there's so much more to Jay Holben. So let's get him on and let's get into it. Jay, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Alan. It's a pleasure to be here. So for those who are not as familiar with your extensive history in the world of filmmaking, could you talk about your journey as a cinematographer, director, author, and educator? Jeez. Um, yeah, a little bit, sure. Um, I, was, I was five years old when I made the decision that I was going to make movies um, after seeing Star Wars. And that sent me on uh, a very long path uh, of my entire life dedicated to this industry and to the idea of directing film. And I started actually making movies. I discovered my mother's eight millimeter camera at about seven years old and started making movies with the neighborhood kids in the backyard. And at about nine, I realized that if I needed to, if I wanted to be the director I wanted to be, I needed to understand what everybody else on the set was doing. So. I actually started professionally as an actor and then moved behind the scenes after that uh, in theater and in film doing everything I possibly could. Uh, and in the 30 some odd years that I've been in the business, I have done every job quite literally in production and post with the exception of hair and makeup, stunts, catering and music composing. Cinematography became a second passion for me, and I stayed in that trade as a director of photography longer than any other role. So I worked as a, a DP for a little over 10 years um, and officially hung up my meter in 2008 uh, as an active cinematographer, but I can't stay away from that trade. So I have been incredibly active in the world of cinematography ever since, even though I work now as a director and producer primarily. And all along the way, uh, really since high school, I've been teaching, teaching filmmaking, teaching lighting, teaching uh, workshops, seminars, more formal programs. I, I taught for the school that was started by Vilmos Zygmunt ASC and Yuri Nyman ASC. Uh, and I stumbled into writing and journalism uh, around 1997, writing for American Cinematographer Magazine. So there's been this secondary ancillary aspect of my career in sharing the knowledge that I've gained and sharing the information that I've gained with others through teaching and writing, uh, which led to writing a couple of books, one of them that you happen to mention. Brilliant. So books. Uh... It wasn't planned, but you just released. Well, it wasn't planned by us. It was planned by you, I'm sure. <laughs> you must have worked on it for a long time. But you just released your latest book, Shotcraft. Could you talk yeah. about it? Absolutely. This is um, a compilation of a column that I've been writing for American Cinematographer Magazine uh, since 2017. And it's an educational column that runs every month in the magazine. It's sort of a cinematography 101, 102, 202. Um, and it, it's been really a, a source of, of honor to be able to write this column for the magazine and to be kind of the voice of education for the next generation of cinematographers and even for vet, top veterans who uh, tell me that they love the refresher of, of reading this column. So this book, Shotcraft, which I'll, I'll do the plug here that I have standing right here. We'll get cheesy for a second. Um, is a compilation of the first five years of this column put together, curated and categorized into a nice flow. Uh, 
so it's just a lot of little educational bits on lighting and optics and filmmaking techniques and career uh, advice, and how to find a mentor and, and all sorts of things. Plug in. Great. Well, I've asked you before the stream if we could give away one of your books today. Uh, so everyone who is joining us today, <laughs> thank you. Well, I want one as well. Uh, well, <laughs> but yeah, uh, this is for everyone who's watching, not for me. Unfortunately, I can't enter. So everyone who's watching, you can enter during the live stream. All you need to do is leave a comment, short craft uh, on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're watching. And uh, the stream yard, the software we're using, will collect all the entries. And at the end of the stream, we will gift this book to one of you. So make sure that you enter and we will uh, bring up this ticker later on as well to remind you. Uh, but let's get into the next question, which is your, I don't know how to describe it. It's like a superstar book. It's, it's a must have. When it came out, I would see it everywhere, you know, every rental I would go to and, and so on. It was just everywhere. The Senior Lens Manual. How did that come about and how long did that take to complete this book? Well, uh, uh, kind of like most of, of the four, well, I guess all of the four books that I put out, it's a little bit of a fluke. Um, it came out and but the short answer of this is realizing the incredible lack of information and amount of misinformation about cinema lenses that's out and available uh, was just incredibly frustrating. And because I had already written two books, I thought this will be the third. This I'll, I'll write something about cine lenses. Um, and I partnered with Christopher Probst. Uh, who have a long time history. Chris and I go back 30 years. Uh, we met at a fledgling junior college in Arizona uh, and moved to Los Angeles together and have been working together for three decades. And I, I thought, like my previous two books, it would take a year or two to put together. It wouldn't be that big of a deal. Um, and it took us eight years. It, it took us eight years because quite honestly we had to learn from the ground up we had we had to learn the fundamentals of the physics of optical design and optical mechanical design and we had to do you know it's a phd level research to be able to understand the subject to be able to write about it and we hit a point where it was just going to be basically the first three chapters and then it just kept growing and we wanted to put more into it and we kept challenging ourselves to to make it bigger and, and and finally we kind of got to the point where we said we're going to write the definitive book on cinema lenses and yeah it, it took us just shy of a decade to do that wow so what was the most challenging thing about writing this book the typing <laughs> the typing what uh, yeah, go on. It, it's hard to pick one. Uh, there was a, a lot of, of blood, sweat, and tears put into this over eight years. Uh, there were some subjects that were just really hard for us to to get the information. Uh, one of them was the, the entire chapter on optomechanics. There's very little written about it. Uh, it's really handed down from generation to generation. So we had to dive in with optomechanical engineers and with lens techs and tear apart lenses ourselves in order to to learn that um i spent but a year of the book on the subject of depth of field alone and, and the nature of focus and understanding focus and what is actually happening to lights within the lens um you know things like that were incredibly challenging but it it was being voracious researchers and diving as deep into this topic as we possibly could and constantly challenging ourselves. So one of us would write a draft of a section, we'd give it to the other who would do an edit and then they would vet and verify the information and add more and then it would come back and 
then you know it'd be my job to vet what Chris added to it and then add some more and be like, oh, look what I found. Oh no, look what I found. Uh, and it became this you know, incredible, fat, <laughs> heavy book. It is, it is really incredible. Um, sometimes I call it, <laughs> I call it the lens Bible by mistake because it's, <laughs> it's just something else. That book is something else. Um, it's a must have for every lens nerd for sure. Um, but there off. are so many lens nerds out there in the world and there's so many cinematographers that are into lenses. What sparked that incredibly deep level of interest in lenses that made you go into all this effort? So that, that's a little bit of a confession. Um, and I, I've shared this story a, a few times now. Um, at, at the time that the inspiration for this book came up, um, I had already retired as a cinematographer, but I'd had more than 10 years of experience in cinematography and, and was still continuing to teach and still continuing to be uh, a writer for American Cinematographer. Chris was an active cinematographer. And I had been asked, uh, I was teaching a series of lenses or teaching a series of, of workshops uh, that were sponsored by Panavision. And I was asked to do a lecture on lenses. And there was a gentleman in the back of the lecture uh, afterwards, who came up and shook my hand and said, hey, it was really, you did a nice job. Thank you very much. And he said, um, my name is Guy McVicker, and, and I'm the head of optics for Panavision Hollywood. And I was like, oh, wow, I'm surprised. We, we've never met, and it's great to meet you. What a pleasure. And he said, you know, I, I do sort of a, an educational spiel for cinematographers. Do you want to come hear that sometime? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to do that. So we set up a, a day to do that, and I called up my buddy Chris, and I said, hey, man, I'm going to go to Panavision and listen to this guy talk about lenses. Do you want to come? And Chris was like, yeah, I do. And we showed up, and, you know, all excited. Let's hear what he's got to say and what's the history of Panavision. And within 15 minutes, he melted our brains. And we realized that at that point, with more than 20 years of cinematography experience between us, we knew nothing nothing about lenses and it was a humbling it, it was exciting and humbling and that inspired us to do uh, two days of testing at Panavision where we shot every 50 millimeter lens that they had in Panavision Hollywood and then we went to another rental house in Los Angeles called Camtech uh, a very optics heavy rental house and we shot every 50 millimeter lens that they had in in house and I wound up taking still captures of all of these and putting them into a single document. And Chris called it the Denny's menu because it became a, a, this menu that he would order the look for his next job and say, I want my next job to look like this. What is that? Oh, it's a Canon K35. I remember that. <clears throat> and that test inspired Chris to go off and buy lenses. And he started buying older lenses and looking into rehousing. And it inspired me to do some deep research because mm. I wanted to know why they were different. Why this, all of these 50 millimeter lenses, every one of them was different. So I started looking into the physics and the science and Chris started going off and buying lenses and exploring and, and trying different looks. And after a while of being frustrated with the lack of information and the misinformation that was out there, I thought that eh, this can be my next book. Uh, and I, I wrote an outline and I sent it to Chris and then he did a version of it, sent it back. And then I did a version, sent it back and we ping pong this thing back and forth about six times one day. And that was the start of the book. Hmm. So a follow up question. How do you test lenses? <laughs> I'll pick Chris's brain, hopefully, at some point, but I want to know your method and what are you looking for? Well, we, we wrote a whole chapter on it. Um, and, and really, there's, there's two fundamental ways to test lenses. There's testing lenses for a specific project, 
in which case you want to incorporate lighting fixtures that you're going to use and lighting techniques that you're going to use and hopefully talents and wardrobe and makeup and incorporate all of these things into an individual test so that you can really refine the look and you should shoot things that you're going to shoot if this is all a night movie then you should be doing night scenes to, to test most of what i do in testing i call the generic lens tests and in that case it's not for a specific project so what i'm trying to do is isolate and exploit every characteristic that i possibly can so i, I have a, a very particular methodology for that trying to uh, within one frame test many different parameters of the lens including contrast color reproduction skin tone acutants uh, testing for uh, coma uh, stigmatism uh, field curvature um, spherical aberration chromatic aberrations all of this can be looked at in really a single frame and then I like to isolate each one of those, to do an isolated bouquet test and an isolated flare test uh, and isolated um, image circle tests. So it, it, it tends to be quite a bit, but yeah, that's part of why we dedicated a, an entire chapter in the book to it, because it, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, but if you know what you're looking for, it's amazing what you can find. Someone who has extensive experience in both cinematography and directing, where do you see lenses in that whole mix? It's one of the principal components of visual storytelling, right? So it's the camera that separates motion pictures from every other art form. And it's the lens that is at the heart of the camera that is capturing light out of your scene and transmitting it onto whatever capture medium we're working with, be that film or digital. And that lens, by the nature of it passing photons of light and waves of light through physical elements of glass onto an imager, imparts uh, a characteristic on the look that is part of the emotional experience of that story. So for directors and cinematographers, it's incredibly important to understand that the choice of lens has an influence on the audience's reaction to that story and how they connect to that story and how those filmmakers want to tell that story. So do you see your story as, as the way you might see the world, you know, very sharp and clean and high contrast and everything is in hyper-focused details? Or is it maybe more of a, a memory where it might be a little hazy and it might be a little fuzzy on the corners and it might have a little lack of contrast. We might see more flares. How do you see that story and how does your audience feel that story? Chris has a, a, a great example that he's thrown out a few times of uh, like a scene of two lovers lying in a wheat field after uh, making love and they're they're lying in their back in the sun and they're intertwining their fingers and, and just being romantic. And how do we see that? Do we see flare of sun through their fingers that, you know, milks out the image because that feels like a memory. It feels like something more emotional and evocative, or do we just see that in sharp hyper detail? There's a completely different emotional reaction to that scene, depending upon the lens used. So, well, part of the reason why we wrote a book, we feel that it's one of the most paramount important aspects of visual storytelling. Love it. Thank you. Great answer. <laughs> um, so we have, we have a bunch of comments coming in. Thanks everyone who's joining us. Um, sure. You know, we've got, we've got some, some of your fans here. <laughs> Bought a book last week. I guess the new one. Uh, Audi Hunty. Um, and oh, not this one. This one. A good stuff. Good Thank stuff, you. guys. Um, anyone who already has the um, 
CineLens manual, please leave a comment. I just, I think, I think pretty much everyone, everyone has it. And if you don't, you must get it. <laughs> and I highly recommend one for every room. They're kind of heavy to move around. <laughs> I so have one in the bedroom and one in the living room and one in the bathroom. Yeah. And it's just yeah. a bit easier. Yeah. A, a great coffee book, even if you don't read it, you know, <laughs> the wife, the wife will be happy to have it on the, on the coffee book table, I'm sure. <laughs> so let's get into the nerdy stuff. What was your first vintage lens that you've owned? Uh, so when it comes to cinema lenses, uh, I don't really own any. Actually, I that's not true. I, I have I have a 1920 uh, Cook, uh, a tiny even prior to the Pancros, uh, and I have a um, LGT uh, Golden Navitar. Those are the only two cinema lenses that I own, and, and they're just really showpieces and, and little pieces of history. Uh, again, because when I started down this road and I started writing this book, I, I was not a cinematographer anymore. So Chris has a, an entire rental house uh, worth of lenses that he's purchased and rehoused and various iterations of them. But um, I don't actually own any. I leave that up to the cinematographers that I work with. The first lens that I ever really worked with uh, was a... a Pentax K1000 um, camera with a 50 mil 1.8, I think. Um, and that was stolen from me. And then I switched. Uh, my wife gave me a, a Canon F1. And so I shot with an FD 50 mil 1.8 for many, many years in stills. Um, and even the cameras that I have now, I, I own a, an EOS R that I shoot with. Um, and I just have the Sigma and Tamron and uh, Rokinon uh, stills for those. I don't have any cine lenses. And, and also part of that is I don't want to lock myself into, oh, I own these, so let's shoot with these, right? I would much, much rather the cinematographer and I sit down and talk about what we need and what is the best for this project and use that. What do you think about those first lenses that you've ever tried? Do you still like them? You know, did, did you find that those were not quite, you know, the thing that you would use nowadays? Oh, I, it, it seems like a cop out, but I love every lens. Uh, every lens has a job. In fact, I, you know, I see people uh, sort of gear shaming people in person and online. Oh, you can't use that. That's crap. And it really, really makes me mad because there isn't any crap out there even the the worst performing lens a, a plastic holga lens creates beautiful imagery in the right hands and in the right moment uh you know we could look at something like the the deaconizers uh, which are just incredibly flawed series of lenses by purpose you know they're designed to be that way um and they're used very, very creatively. So every lens has a place, every lens has a job. Um, and yeah, I, I love them all. Uh, and I love seeing things that I've never seen before. Awesome. So do you actually prefer modern or vintage lenses and why? I, I have a personal um, inclination towards vintage. Uh, I, really like a little more character uh, imparted in the lens than just something, um, you know, more precise and accurate to real life. Uh, I, I like to add a, a little bit of something to it. Uh, so I, I tend to lean a little bit more in the vintage world, but it that also depends really on what you're shooting um, and what the story is. Brilliant. So we have one of the first questions from our audience. Some this guy. Asked previously. Yes, this guy, he knows, <laughs> he knows everything already, but <laughs> he wants to know your opinion. Uh, what lens for landscape nation first made you look beyond the usual, uh, and very reliable rental lens offerings. You know, one of the big uh, discoveries for us on that Panavision and Camtech test that Chris and I did so many years ago, 
uh, was the Canon K35s. Uh, it, we both fell in love with the look of this lens that really prior to that point was not a very popular optic. Uh, when they came out, they were sort of dismissed by most of the high end uh, Hollywood world as the poor man's super speed. Um, and really relegated to low budgets and people who couldn't afford better. But they're incredibly beautiful. The character that they impart is beautiful. The creaminess of the lack of sharp contrast uh, are extraordinary. And that it was the Canon K35 that inspired Chris to go absolutely nuts in the vintage world. And it was part of that that inspired me to want to understand physically why these things were so different so put a lot of love on the k35s and anybody who reads through the book knows that there's quite a bit of information on the k35s we spend a lot of time talking about them because my co-author is um we can say obsessed <laughs> i think it's fair to say obsessed all right right so there was a follow-up from daniel that just didn't fit into that first one um which you might have answered already, but was it purely digital, the desire to control the look and the image in the camera, or, or was it a specific Eureka moment? Absolutely. This has a, a huge factor to play in the popularity of vintage lenses and in the whole rise of interest of lenses. So when the primary medium, really the only medium for motion pictures was motion picture film, that's uh, an image degradation process. Uh, we, we shoot a camera negative that is then processed to an interpositive, that is then processed to an internegative, and then processed to a positive. And every stage of that degrades the image. So what we see in theaters when we were looking at film projection was really a compromised image and a variation of the original camera negative. Because of that degradation process, uh, optical designers for almost a century were fighting to create lenses that had better contrast, better resolving power, and better sharpness. And that was the aim of optical design, better contrast, better sharpness, better resolution. When we switched to digital origination, that degradation process is removed. And so we're pretty much looking at our original negative, our digital negative, not a phrase I happen to like, but it makes sense, uh, on the screen. There's, there's no intermediates. There's no interpositive, internegative. And suddenly that was, for many creative artists, uh, too clean. It didn't look like decades and decades of movies that we've seen. It looked too precise, too accurate, too sharp. So that turned many filmmakers into looking at less perfect lenses in order to recreate that compromised image that we're used to seeing. So digital cameras played a massive role in this whole vintage look. In addition to that, looking at the release of the Red One, uh, that introduced thousands and thousands of PL mount cameras into the marketplace in, in a very short period of time. Prior to the Red One, it was about a quarter of a million dollars to own a 35 millimeter professional film package. Now suddenly a, a camera's introduced at about $60,000 and that placed a demand on PL lenses that the market was not prepared to deal with. And that opened the doors for many other companies to start taking lens, still lenses and older lenses and rehousing and remounting and this whole rush towards give us lenses to use because we have so many more owner operators. So let's then jump ahead into the future right away no. and talk about AI and filmmaking and where do vintage lenses and film cameras sit in that mix i have uh i've been diving relatively deep into uh the ai technology um and i sit on the ai committee for the asc's motion imaging technology council 
Um, and a huge part of that is I have most of my career tried incredibly hard to stay on top of technology and be at the forefront to understand the tools that are available and to know how to use them. There are far too many filmmakers that I see that become afraid of the next generation of technology and they fight against it and they wind up getting bulldozed by it and left kind of in the dust because technology will move on. We, we, we can't stop that from happening. We're not going to stop AI from becoming part of our industry. It, it already is. It already permeates so much of our lives and people aren't necessarily even aware of it. But I, I've been delving really, really deeply in the last six months into the technology of AI. And there will be filmmakers who will make entirely AI generated films. There are already short films being made that are completely uh, prompt generated and, and AI created. And there will probably soon be a feature film, but that will not be the norm. It, it's not going to happen that that's going to replace filmmakers or replace cinematographers, but the tools of computer generated or generative or prompt based imagery will become something that we use on a constant basis. They will, AI will absolutely replace rotoscope artists. It's already starting to now. AI will permeate our world in uh, language translation and lip uh, syncing. Um, that technology is already with us now. AI will permeate pre vids and pre production on a, a, a gargantuan scale. And we're seeing these tools come in now where we're able to do conceptual art and we're able to start stabilizing the AI images to do pre vids and storyboarding. Where I'm having conversations with engineers and software designers who are working with this is in optics and saying, can we take an AI engine and say, I want to generate this image and I want it to look like it was shot with a cook speed pan crow, or I want it to look like it was shot with a Lomo anamorphic. And the AI, if we feed it enough images, hundreds of thousands of images, can start to learn those characteristics and apply them. Then it might even be possible to take the Roger Deakins approach of shooting with incredibly clean, uh, incredibly accurate, uh, very low character lenses, and then apply the look of a vintage lens in post-production and say, we're going to get the cleanest image that we can and the best image. And now we're going to put on a, a Helios 44 or Jupiter look or a Lomo look and apply that through machine learning, um, generative images at the end. All of that is possible and probably will be available within the next year or two. Man, that sounds scary. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Do you th what's your personal opinion? Will people still want to do stuff in camera the way they always want it? Because, you know, the lens overlays and flares and, you know, various tricks have been available for, for a while now. But people still want to, you know, get a real thing. They don't want to uh, slap on the anamorphic flares in post-production if they can get away with it. They, you know, they wanna, they wanna see what they can get in camera. You know, where he's accidentally, you know, hits it or whatever. But especially, I think cinematographers, they wanna, you know, they want to have some say in it <laughs> as much as possible. And post-production takes away a lot of that. So. Um, what, what, how, how do you feel? But, you know, obviously, then there are going to be people who will be embracing it and it will be like having so much fun with it. You know, what's what's the other side of it? The onus is on the cinematographers to understand the technology and to control the technology and to implement themselves as part of it. So technology does not do well on its own without the artist. Uh, we, you know, we, we were terrified uh, when no, many were terrified when digital technology came in that it was going to replace, you know, we no longer needed to light and we no longer needed uh, the cinematographer. We just set up a camera, we'll capture everything and then we'll create it all in post. And 
that hasn't come to be right there it's every new technology scares the bejesus out of the lay of the last generation and the way to really make sure that we're going to incorporate this properly is to understand it get in there and learn it and control it you know i i am uh evangelizing to all filmmakers to learn things like unreal engine and to learn ai and to understand how it can be implemented and how you as a creative artist can utilize those tools uh, to make your work better to take care of the tedious work that none of us want to do like rotoscoping and concentrate more on the creative work um like i said somebody is going to make a, a completely ai movie it's going to happen there'll probably be a you know a dozen of them a year that are made that way but i don't believe that will be the norm we're still going to have artists we're still going to have steven spielberg and chris nolan and quentin tarantino's and roger deakins and greg frazier and the men lebeski's uh doing what they do as artists you know the the camera did not replace the painter we still have painters we still have traditional artists it's just going to be another tool in the world and if you want to stay relevant you need to understand it right so a little bit of housekeeping guys uh, i'm seeing a lot of comments saying short craft and some of them have emojis and you know other characters but what uh, it means that let's see our giveaway tab we only have two entries we only have two entries because you must comment only words short craft as shown on the screen so make sure guys that you the ones that commented with other characters or in a different way just comment again please saying short craft so i can collect your entries because they're collected automatically otherwise it's only two people that have entered so do it again please because <laughs> um, we want to we want to give everyone a fair chance um so one of my favorite questions because i'm just a nerd like that <laughs> you and me uh, both what's uh, what's your favorite vintage lens or a vintage lens set and why <laughs> it, it's it's literally like trying to ask a, a parent uh you know what their favorite who their favorite kid is um i i don't have any and it's again it's not a cop out i love them all I really do because every lens has a different job and, and a different uh, approach and, and, a, and a different emotion. So there's no one like go to for me. Um, what I've been asking manufacturers to do for many years now is to introduce a series of lenses that have variable character in them. And we're starting to see these come into the marketplace right now, which is incredibly exciting. Uh, from the Auto Blods to the Pestful Lux to Ian Neal's Module 8 uh, adapter. You know, these tools that allow you to take a single lens or a single series and vary its character shot to shot, that's what I've been looking for for quite a while. So those are, are introductions that I'm really excited about. But I don't have any, I don't have a go-to. I don't have like a... I have no favorites. Yeah, they're, I love them all. A <laughs> great answer. So in that case, then, uh, let's spin it the other way around. What's the most underrated lens or set of lenses, in your opinion? You know, um, Denis Lois, uh, ASC, AFC, um, did a an amazing lens test with the French Society, the AFC, uh, a couple of years ago and it was, uh, they tested, I think it was around 30 sets of lenses, uh, at a couple of different stops and a couple of different focal lengths. And they presented the results of this test blindly to the audience. So you saw a, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, back to back. And you were given a, a sheet to fill out your opinion on each of the lenses and you watched the test uh, back to back multiple times. So the first time you watched the test, you looked at contrast and you noted uh, 
crappy contrast on this one. Oh, I love that. Uh, too much flare, you know, whatever. And then the second time you looked at sharpness and the third time you looked at flare. And at the end of this test, he handed out a cheat sheet that revealed what everybody was choosing. And I sat in a room full of ASC cinematographers watching this test. Uh, and I watched all of them just their heads explode at the end of this. Many top cinematographers picked uh, Zeiss CP2s as a very high ranked look. And I was blown away myself that I picked Ari Zeiss Ultra Primes as one of my favorites from that test. And it really, it was incredibly surprising and, and a little humbling that even at the level of understanding that I have of optics, and as much as I am out there saying there's no bad lenses, don't ignore anything, everything's great, I was saying, oh no, these are middle of the road milk toast, and we don't, eh, whatever. And suddenly I'm in love with them. Like these are phenomenal. So that was really surprising for me and, and also just drove home the idea that you you can't dismiss anything. So kind of the answer to that question for me at that time, ultra primes were incredibly underrated. People were just ignoring them. Now we're seeing them pop up a lot more as a, a favorite to customize with rental houses. There's a lot of customized sets of ultra primes. And a big reason for that is because all of the elements are still available for them. So you can easily tweak them and still get replacement elements or you can recode elements. It's a lot harder, as you well know, uh, working in vintage lenses because there's no parts and there's no elements to replace if things get broken. Yeah. Yeah. Ultra primes. You've heard it here, guys. I've, I've heard about this. Um, I've heard, I've seen some custom projects uh, done with ultra primes. They even sometimes, you know, change up the body a little bit, all well, the, the colors and stuff, just to make them, just to make them a little bit different. Uh, it's a cool project for sure. And just to agree with what you said, I was, I was doing yet to be released <laughs> tests from from a while back because I just, I have so many tests I need to release. But one of them was Canon FD 15. Wait, what? Is it? No, 14 millimeter. The, the elusive expensive Canon kind of 14 millimeter 2.8 before I had to sell mine because it was just too expensive for me to keep. Uh, I've done a test with uh, versus uh, the EF Mark I hmm. and the CNE, the modern, you know, the latest. And I was shocked by how nice the CNE was in certain aspects. It was just so much more superior than the other two in certain things. Obviously, you know, others had a bit more vintage this and that, but you know, the, the certain things, it, I was just like, whoa, you know, this this lens. Yes, it's not vintage. Yes, I'm supposed to love vintage lenses only, but for certain things, I would absolutely choose this one rather than the Canon FD or even the older EF version. Um, <laughs> The CNEs are, are a great series, and I think unfortunately they got a little bit dismissed because they were EF uh, and not PL. Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of people thumb their nose at them, but they're, it's a great series of glass. Uh, you know, it, in the same heritage and, and evolution of the Canon FDs and the K35s that people love so much. Mm. Right. So now I see we have. 16 entries so well done guys uh, it's now working keep keep uh, putting that comment in the ones that haven't entered the ones that already entered once no need entering again just enter once it will record your entry uh, and everyone leaving comments with questions we'll get to those at the very end so it's actually a good time now to drop any questions that you have because we will be getting to those very soon um but i have another one for me selfishly <laughs> i want another one <laughs> absolutely um so um here's another one for me 
what was the most recent lens you've had in your hands and what did you think about it? Something that you tested for the first time, maybe, you know? Man, uh, well, I, uh, it's actually been a few months, but I, I would have to say probably the, the most recent um, that was, well, no, okay. That's, Turn the bus around. Uh, <laughs> I just realized that I, I just finished um, a test shoot of the new Gecko Cam Opia series of lenses. Um, and this was a series, um, the cinematographer that I've been working with quite a bit uh, in the last few years, Katie Williams. Um, Katie uh, was at NAB and she sent me a text and said, you've got to check out these Gecko Cams. They're, they're amazing. And I never made it over there. I was just slammed the entire time at NAB, so I never got to see them. And then I was uh, hosting a lens day for the ASC in New York, and I'm running all around and you know helping organize and, and keep everything flowing and working. And I walk past the monitors as they've set up the live shots, and I stop dead in my tracks and I look at one of the monitors. And I'm like, "What? Am, what is? Oh, this is a gecko cam. This is oh." oh Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, wow. So I got in touch with Gecko Cam and uh, Lily over there. And, and I said, you know, I would love to, I'd love to play with these. And she said, great, here you go. Here's a set, uh, go. And uh, we wound up shooting a, a short with them. And I, uh, I'm infatuated. Uh, they're, they're a custom design ground up. They're not a, a rehouse. They're not, um, you know, a, a variation of an existing lens. It's a completely bespoke design with intense character built in, uh, offered in multiple variations of uh, multi-coat, single coat, and uncoat. Um, and man, they are, they're gorgeous. They're, they're super fast. Um, and they're coming out with another series of ultra speed uh, T11s and that's so for recently what i've gotten my hands on uh the gecko cam opias um and whew, man when those things come out they're gonna make a splash i don't know if those are the same ones i've seen at the bsc last year um but they had something really cool uh that had a lot of things going for it maybe maybe those were the same ones i don't remember but you know gecko cam can do no wrong right <laughs> anything that they they do it's it's gonna be brilliant well, I think again in in the early days they were kind of dismissed as, oh, you guys are just rehousing lenses and you know, set and putting them under your own label, uh, and they really kind of quietly come up to introduce some powerful tools. I mean, the vintage series are phenomenal. The the Genesis thirty five vintage, uh, and now these these Opias are seriously they're it's going to be hard to get your hands on them because i think they're going to be incredibly pop uh, popular lenses right and so that just became a, an ad for gecko so hey, whatever it is whatever, whatever is the last um uh, set or lens because at the beginning i was going to ask you what was the last vintage lens but i thought like you know let it be whatever it is you know we, we, we're, mm. we're not hating on modern lenses <laughs> especially not modern lenses that have a vintage feel Exactly, exactly. Nothing wrong with that. So now we're getting to the live QA time from you know the comments that we received on Facebook and YouTube. So if you guys haven't answered uh, ask the question, ask it now and we will try to answer it. because uh, we have about 12 minutes to go. So get your questions in. And the first one we have is from Hero Media, what's a lens that you have discovered that most people have never used? Um, well, it, theoretically, because I've never had my hands on a physical copy, um, the, oh man, and, and the name just jumped out of my head. Uh, Chris and I fought like crazy whether or not we were even going to include uh, this lens in the book. And it, uh, Oh no! It's gone. It's out of my head. Uh, uh, the 
<laughs> oh no this is this is old man brain um uh, give me a second I'll, I'll come back to that because it's gonna okay some... okay let's come back to that one the garuto uh, sorry oh. got it it came back to me so um there was a um, an engineer uh steven garuto uh in the 60s who created a variation of cook lenses by putting additional elements annular elements donut shaped lenses that created a deep depth of field fast lens and it was used on half a dozen productions and then disappeared from uh, existence i have only met one cinematographer who ever had one in their hands um, but it's a fascinating concept that i would love somebody else to come up and, and play with and uh yeah chris and i kind of butt heads as to whether or not we were going to put it in the book because we could never find a physical copy of it but i found enough evidence and enough um reports and talks about it to be able to say no this existed it was used on these projects um so the garuzzo lens was the one that uh definitely most people have not heard of love it all right next one um so Colin has an OG Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera, you know, the one with the Super 16 sensor, the microphone for its mount. Uh, I've had one. I don't know if you've, if you've had one, but I loved it because it allowed me to discover Super 16 lenses. So his question is, if you have any recommendations for maybe C-mount ones, maybe something else, because you can you can actually make a lot of lenses work with the microphone for its mount. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's part of the beauty of not necessarily the smaller sensor, but the shallower flange is that it adapts to pretty much anything. Uh, it, it's, it probably is going to be a, a benign comment, but I would say uh, super speeds, take a look at those. Um, they're really incredible glass that was made that do have some wonderful character to them. And if you can get a, a, your hands on an uh, LGT, uh, golden avatar which was a c-mount uh that has a beautiful quality to it uh, obviously it's just one focal length um, but man they're they're really nice other than that man it, it's there's too many options way too many options out there uh, but uh, scour the old ebays mm. agreed agreed oh the hunte uh, my favorite series of lenses are Panavision T series. The bokeh that creates uh, it's the bokeh that that creates the magic. What are other lenses close to the T series in terms of bokeh and fall off, etc.? Ooh, I don't know. That's a that's a tough one because that's a you know when you talk about the T series that that is a, an evolution of Panavision anamorphic design um and it is evoking the feeling of the c series with better correction and better mechanics so the t series was named after um tak miyagashima uh who was um one of the most extraordinary uh, optical and uh, opto mechanical engineers for panavision for many 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 years uh and tak passed away um about a decade ago and this series of lenses is pretty much what he had always dreamed of and what he had always wanted to create uh which is the reason why they called it the t series and it, it has the feeling of the traditional panavision c series but with better correction better consistency uh and better mechanics and that's that's really hard to match you know i i I think that what Atlas did with the Orions uh, has a really sort of Panavision evocative kind of feel in a significantly uh, less expensive package. Um, but it, even that, it's not really hitting that particular kind of magic that Panavision has. Plus, they're rotating astigmatizers, um, the way that their anamorphot is designed and incorporated. Actually, I think probably the closest would be the um, uh, chameleons, the Caldwell chameleons, uh, would probably be the closest thing that I could think of to a T-series out in the non-Panavision market. 
Wow. Music freak, I would like to see some classic lens formula in modern mirrorless mount, but with AF. Surely that's possible. Uh, oof, that one's really, really tough. Uh, so in order to get autofocus, you need to have the lightest components possible and the smallest components possible because those little tiny motors need to be able to move those elements with incredible speed and precision and hopefully quiet. Um, you know, it, it's a reason why we don't see autofocus in cinema lenses so much, first of all, because just the way that we work, uh, we don't want the tools making the decisions for us. We want to make the decisions of what is in focus and what isn't in focus. But it is with the mechanics that we have in cinema lenses, it is incredibly difficult to incorporate motors, keep them quiet, keep them light, keep them fast, don't use too much power. Um, so that's tough. What you're looking at, obviously, are um, companies like Rokinon and, and Tamron and Sigma in their still lenses, which are great, great, great designs. Um, and those have autofocus because they're smaller. They have plastic components. Uh, they're not necessarily as thermal tolerant. They're not necessarily as consistent over time because of that thermal intolerance. Uh, but that's what it takes to put autofocus in a lens is lighter components and honestly could have plastic components. It's a lot harder to create the consistency in, in the mechanical precision that we need. So is it possible? Not, not really. <laughs> well, here's the answer, Matt. <laughs> I know you've been dreaming about it, but maybe, maybe no, maybe just use the, the new LiDAR out of focus. No, the new LiDAR full of focus and sort of yeah. live with that. Um, Audi Hunter says, thank you. I'm glad we could help. Uh, greetings from Sicily from my Facebook user. I'm not seeing your name or Hello. your picture because you need to allow StreamYard to see it. The link is uh, in the description of the stream. Uh, but let's get back to our questions. We don't have that much time, guys. So if you want to ask a question, ask it now because we are doing the last few questions because it has been almost an hour now. So what was the next one? Oh, this one's interesting. Kinoview. Uh, lenses are created for all sorts of light sources per se. Have you ever been able to distinguish different responses from lenses depending on tungsten, HMI, or LED light technology? Not really, no. And, and this is something that I did experiment with um, quite a bit, but mostly you, you got to think about it the other way. Like, yes, lenses are, are created for particular uh, aspects of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we have lenses that are, are more apt to allow uh, ultraviolet or infrared radiation and lenses that don't. But when we get into the visible spectrum, into light, um, pretty much everything is, is about the same. And because our light sources are designed to work on the same Calvin uh, locus, right, the uh, I'm losing the, the word of that, but the, basically the Calvin scale with, within the, the color spectrum, uh, they're all emitting a similar spectral combination of wavelengths that lenses are going to see pretty much universally the same. So if you started playing with lights that were not designed for photography and for our industry, say, sodium vapor lamps or uh, metal halide lamps that are designed for uh, machine imaging or, or something of that nature, you may get some wild results. Uh, you know, even just ultraviolet fixtures can introduce some wild results. But when you're dealing in the visible spectrum, everything is, is pretty uniform. Um, even when it comes in, in terms of, of flare, I was experimenting with 
really saturated sources to see how coatings worked with uh, very narrow bandwidth uh, light emission. And really most of our modern coatings are just really good and they're pretty uniform in the way that they approach things. Right. So we're coming up to the end, guys. I'm going to try a few more questions, but it's your last chance to enter to win Jay's book, Shotcraft, that was just released and he was kind enough <laughs> to give one to one of you guys. So make sure to put a comment in if you haven't put it in and we're going to choose the winner in the next few minutes. Uh, but here's probably one of the last ones and I guess quite irrelevant to your writing. Um, El Correa says with all the new lenses coming out weekly <laughs> from new companies and houses, had any plans to do a region or appendix or on the senior lens manual to keep it up to date over time? Tough question. You would not believe that uh, literally the week that the senior lens manual was released, people were asking me this question. And my response uh, was, screw you, get out, leave me alone. Um, but I'd actually, uh, quite um, honestly, uh, Chris and I are working already on uh, a follow-up. And what we're doing is it will be a, a, a compendium or, or um, an additional book. We probably won't do an update, uh, a significant update to the Sydney Lens Manual, leave it as it is now, and we'll introduce a second volume that will pick up where that left off. Uh, with all sorts of lenses that have been introduced and new technologies and, and new approaches uh, that have been introduced since we finished that. So not only are we working on that, but we are also working on the Cine Camera Manual, which will be two books, one dedicated to the entire evolution of motion picture cameras in 16 and 35, and one dedicated to electronic and digital cameras. Uh, so we're working hard on, on other books because, I don't know, we're masochists. Um, we're idiots. I, I don't know. We somehow just like the pain, uh, and we're doing more. Great. Great. Now we know. Now we know. You heard it first, guys. Heard it first here, what I meant to say. So let's pick the winner of this. Okay, let's, let's, let's switch on. How do I do it? This is the first time doing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come on, share screen, giveaway. All right, you can guys see this now. 24 entries. I'll need to press draw, and we have this cool graphic, and we're gonna have <laughs> our winner. Who is and... <laughs> <laughs> Daniel? Almost next time, Daniel. <laughs> uh, Lucas Rayson uh you want the amazing new book um we'll we'll arrange for you to get in touch with jay after the stream right and uh absolutely to to get your copy uh daniel so, it was that close for you man uh daniel uh next time I'll, I'll have to get uh jay in for part two and give you another chance <laughs> ah brilliant love it it's the feature in the in the stream i thought well, That's will I like use it? And I feel like we're on the game show. Yeah, it's it's cool. It's exciting. It gives gives uh, something to look forward to, to everyone who who has joined us live. Um, so, then, let's uh, wrap it up. But I have one more question to ask before we end. Um, if you could only use one lens for the rest of your life, what would it be? <laughs> uh, um. My eyeball. <laughs> That's Find a, a way. It's a good Seriously. answer, but I will not allow it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Give me <yeah>. a lens. <laughs> uh, you know what? If I had to be stuck with uh, just one, I would probably be shooting Super 35 format, and it would be a 50 mil. Um, and I would probably be with something like a, an Ultra Prime that you know has some character but can be clean and be flexible for a, a lot of different looks um i i found a lot of my career I, I i tended to lean towards a 40 mil um but in today's you know a little bit larger sensors and, and 
50 let's just say 50 ultra prime and, I, and i'll just uh, and you'll be happy with that horrible i'll take that i'll definitely take the answer i really appreciate it, jay thanks so much for coming in uh it was a lot of fun for me i'll be rewatching it myself and uh, i hope it was enjoyable to everyone else and yeah, uh, it was it was a lot of fun uh, thank you for what you do thank you for all the work that you do uh your support of the community your support of vintage lenses is, is extraordinary um and, and thank you oh it's, it's an honor to hear from you thanks so much jay and thanks for everyone who joined us today uh have a great rest of your sunday and we'll see you again bye bye everybody <laughs>